welcome back to Historical American Girl Read Alouds with Mrs. Mansfield. To start out today, I want to show you a timeline. This is a timeline of all of the historical dolls in the American Girl collection. So our timeline starts way over here at 1764 with Kaya. You can see um, the dates along the bottom go by like five year increments. And then in each of the signs that has the doll's name, it says their actual year. So the dolls are placed about where they were in time. So we have Kaya, Felicity and Elizabeth, Caroline, Josefina, Cecile and Marie Grace, Kirsten, Addie, Samantha and Nellie, Rebecca, Kit and Ruthie, Nanea, Molly and Emily, Mary Ellen, Melody, and Julie and Ivy. And the timeline ends at the year 2000. So we're starting out with this timeline today because the first series I read was the Meet Kit series. So Kit lived, or she was nine years old, when her story took place in 1934. But now I'm going to go jump back almost a hundred years to 1824. So actually 110 years. So if you're looking at this timeline from kind of far away there, you can see what a span it is from where Josefina is all the way to where Kit and Ruthie are. And the other thing I want to show you before I start reading the Meet Josefina books to you is a map of the United States. So there's the map of the United States. So not only did Kit and Josefina live more than 100 years apart, but they also lived in different parts of the country. You can see Kit here lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Josefina lives near Santa Fe, New Mexico. So while Kit lived in the Midwest part of the United States, Josefina lives in the Southwest. So here I am with Josefina. This is Josefina Montoya. You can see that she's got um, some traditional clothing on and we'll talk about where she came from and her family family's background in today's story. So here's Josefina and this is her kitchen table set. So there she is. I love this kitchen table set. It has this little secret drawer, the secret compartment right here where you can put stuff in. So we're going to start with the first story about Josefina called Meet Josefina. And in the beginning of the book, Meet Josefina, it tells us that Josefina and her family speak Spanish. So you'll see some Spanish words in this book. If you can't tell what a word means from reading the story or looking at the illustrations, you can turn to the glossary of Spanish words that begins on page 84. It will tell you what the word means and how to pronounce it. Remember that in Spanish, J is pronounced like H. That means Josefina's name is pronounced Josefina. So instead of Josefina with a J in English, it's Josefina. So Josefina lived, as I said before, in 1824. It's kind of what her world would have looked like in 1824. And at that time, the area where she lived in New Mexico was not part of the United States. It was part of Mexico. Mexico had quite a mix of cultures. Um, and in the Southwest, in New Mexico, first there had been Indians. There had been Pueblo Indians and other types of Indians. And Josefina encounters Indians and has friends that are Indian in some of the stories. So we'll be talking about um, them later on. But then the Spanish came all the way over from Europe and conquered much of Mexico. 
And that's how Mexico got Spanish as their language. Just the way that we here in the United States speak English because the country of England came over and made colonies here and gave us our language. The country of Spain had colonies in Mexico and that's how Mexico got the Spanish language. So there's a lot of Spanish influences in Mexico and in the Southwest. And then at one point, Mexico overthrew the Spanish people that were ruling them, just like when we had the Revolutionary War and the Americans kicked out the English or the British as their rulers, the same thing happened with Mexico. So um, in 1821, when Josefina was only six, is when Mexico won its freedom from Spain. So at the time she lives, the area of New Mexico, the area near Santa Fe is all part of Mexico, not actually part of the United States. And so here's a map that shows how all of this part of the United States at this point in time was part of Mexico. And in the story, it talks about El Camino Real, which is this road right here. So that's where Josefina lived. And this is probably what much of it would have looked like. So with that, let's begin reading Mi Josefina, chapter one. Primroses. Josefina Montoya hummed to herself as she stood in the sunshine waiting for her sisters. It was a bright, breezy morning in late summer, and the girls were going to the stream to wash clothes. Josefina's basket was full of laundry to be washed, but she didn't mind. She enjoyed going to the stream on a day like this. The sky was a deep, strong blue. Josefina wished she could touch it. She was sure it would feel smooth and cool. Josefina liked to stand just in front of her house where the life of her papa's rancho was going on all around her. From here, she could smell the sharp scent of smoke from the kitchen fire. She could see cows and sheep grazing in the pastures. Yellow grass rolled all the way to the green, dark green trees on the foothills of the mountains, and the mountains zigzagged up to the sky. She could hear all the sounds of the rancho, chickens clucking, donkeys braying, dogs barking, birds chirping, workers hammering, and someone laughing. The sounds seemed like music to Josefina. The wind joined in the music when it rustled the leaves on the cottonwood trees. And always under it all was the murmur of the stream. Josefina shaded her eyes. Even from this far away, she could see Papa. He sat very straight and tall on his horse. He was talking to the workers in the cornfield near the stream. The rancho had belonged to Papa's family for more than 100 years. All those years, Papa's family had cared for the animals and the land. It was not an easy life. Everyone had to work hard. Some years there was plenty of rain so that the crops grew and the animals were healthy. Some years there was not enough rain. Then the soil was dry and the animals went thirsty. But through good times and bad, the rancho went on. It provided everything Josefina and her family needed to live. It gave them food, clothing, and shelter. Josefina loved the rancho. It was her home. She believed that it was the most beautiful place in all of New Mexico and all of the world. Josefina was dancing a little dance of impatience to go with the song she was humming when her oldest sister, Anna, came outside to join her. Josefina, Anna said, you remind me of a little bird singing and hopping from one foot to the other like that. 
If I were a bird, said Josefina with a grin, I could have flown to the stream and back 20 times by now. I've been waiting and waiting for you. Where are Francisca and Clara? Anna sighed. They're coming, she said. They couldn't agree on whose turn it was to carry the washing tub. Josefina and Anna looked at each other and shook their heads. They got along beautifully, but Francisca and Clara, the middle sisters, often disagreed. It was always over some silly little thing. They reminded Josefina of goats she had seen ramming into each other head to head for no particular reason. When the girls appeared at last, it was easy to see who had won the argument. Francisca, looking pleased with herself, carried only a basket of laundry balanced on her head. Clara, looking cross, carried the large copper washing tub. Josefina put her basket into the copper tub. I'll take one handle of the tub, Clara, she said. We'll carry it between us, Clara said. Gracias, but she sounded more grumpy than grateful. Josefina knew a way to cheer her up. Let's race to the stream, she said. Oh no, Francisca began to say. She didn't like to do anything that might muss her clothes or her hair. But Josefina and Clara had already taken off running, so Anna and Francisca had to run too. The sisters flew down the dirt, dirt path that sloped past the fruit trees, past the fields, and to the stream. Josefina and Clara reached the stream first, plunked the tub down, kicked off their moccasins, and ran into the shallow water. Then they turned and scooped up handfuls of water to splash Anna and Francisca, who shrieked with laughter as the water hit them. Stop, cried Francisca. She held up her basket to shield her face. Now girls, Anna scolded gently, we've come to wash the clothes that are in our baskets, not the ones we're wearing. Josefina and Clara stopped splashing. They were out of breath anyway. They filled the copper tub with water from the stream. Josefina knelt next to the tub. She took the root of a yucca plant out of the little leather pouch she wore at her waist and then pounded it between two rocks. The shredded yucca root made a nice lather of soapy bubbles in the water. Josefina put a dirty shirt in the tub and scrubbed it all over. Then she swooshed it around in the stream to rinse out the soap. The sun was hot on her head and her back, and the water was cool on her arms and hands. Josefina liked to think about how the water started out as snow on the mountaintops. It melted and flowed all the way down to this little pool in the stream without ever losing its cool freshness. She knew that it was water that brought life to the rancho. Water from the stream was channeled into ditches so that it would flow through fields, through the fields. Without water, nothing would grow. Josefina twisted the shirt to wring it out and watched drops of water fall back into the stream and go on their way. Then she carefully spread the shirt on top of a bush. The sun and the breeze will dry the clothes quickly today, she said as she washed some socks. Yes, agreed Anna. Mama would have said, you see girls, God has sent us a good drying day. Monday is laundry day, even in heaven. And then Mama would have said, pull your rebosos up to shade your face, girls. You don't want your skin to look like old leather, added Francisca who was always careful of her skin. So let's stop there for a second because Josefina is wearing her rebozo. A rebozo is kind of like a shawl or a really long, big scarf. That's what this is. So they could wear rebozos around their shoulders like she is now, or they could pull them up and wear them over their heads, like in the picture there that was in the, that was in the book, but it would shade them from the sun so that they didn't get 
too many wrinkles, or it could keep them warm if they wanted um, a headscarf around. And it also mentioned her little leather pouch, which she has right here. Here's her little leather pouch that she had the yucca plant roots in. So you can see, obviously back then, they didn't have washing machines. They had to go to the stream to wash their clothes and they had to make soap from the plants that were around them. But Josefina has a very positive attitude about things and so she's enjoying her time there doing the laundry. Oops. The sisters laughed softly together and then grew quiet. Speaking of their mama always made them thoughtful. Mama had died a little more than a year ago. The sorrow of her death was always in their hearts. Josefina looked at the stream flowing past and listened to its low rushing sound. Since mama died, she had learned a truth that was both bitter and sweet. She had learned that love does not end. Josefina would always love Mama, and so she would always miss her. Josefina knew her sisters were also thinking about Mama because Francisca said, look, see those yellow flowers across the stream? She pointed with a soapy hand. Aren't they evening primroses? They're in the shade, so they haven't wilted yet this morning. Mama used to love those flowers. Yes, she did, said Clara, agreeing with Francisca for once. Why don't you pick some, Josefina? You could dry them and put them in your memory box. All right, said Josefina. Papa had given her a little wooden box of Mama's. Josefina called it her memory box because in it she kept small things that reminded her of Mama, such as a piece of Mama's favorite lavender scented soap. The box had been made by Josefina's great, great grandfather. On its top, there was a carving of the sun coming up over the highest mountain and shining on the rancho, just the way Josefina saw it rise every morning. The quickest, driest way to the primroses was to walk across a fallen log that made a narrow bridge over the stream. Josefina climbed up onto the log. She held her arms out for balance and began to walk across. Oh, do be careful, warned Anna. Because she was the oldest sister, Anna had become a motherly worrier since Mama died. Josefina did not think of herself as a brave person at all. She was afraid of snakes and lightning and guns and shy of people she didn't know. But she wasn't afraid of crossing the log, which wasn't very high above the stream anyway. She walked across, picked the primroses, and tucked the stems into her pouch. She would let the yellow flowers stick out so that they wouldn't be crushed. On the way back, she decided to tease Anna to make her laugh. She pretended to lose her balance. She waved her arms wildly up and down and wobbled more and more with each step. Josefina Montoya, said Anna, who saw that she was fooling. How can you be so shy and sweet in company when you're so playful with your sisters? You tease the life out of me. You'll make me old before my time. You sound just like our grandfather, said Josefina as she jumped to the ground. She pretended to talk like Abuelito. Yes, 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 my beautiful granddaughters. This was the finest trip I've ever made. Oh, the adventures, the adventures. But this was my last trip. Oh, how these trips age me. They make me old before my time. All the sisters sang out together. Abuelito said the same thing after every journey. The word abuelito means grandfather in Spanish. Abuelito was her mama's father. He was a trader and once a year he organized a huge caravan. 
The caravan was made up of many carts pulled by oxen and many mules carrying packs. The carts and the mules were loaded with wool, hides, and blankets in New Mexico. Then the caravan traveled more than a thousand miles south to Mexico City. The trail the caravans used was called the Camino Real. When Abuelito got to Mexico City, he traded the goods he brought from New Mexico for things from all over the world. He traded for silk and cotton goods and lace, for iron tools, pink paper, ink, books, fine dishes, coffee, and sugar. Then the caravan would load up and start the long trip back to New Mexico. Abuelito had been gone more than six months. Josefina and her sisters were excited because they expected Abuelito's caravan to return any day now. Their rancho was always the caravan's last stop before the town of Santa Fe, where Abuelito lived. So let me show you again real quick the picture of the map so you can see how far away it was that her father, her grandfather had gone. So Santa Fe is all the way up here. So this part of the United States, this, is, this would be Texas, New Mexico, California. To get to Mexico City, her grandfather had to travel all the way down here. That's pretty far through Mexico. So really long trip when you think about they were walking on foot with horses and burros. And so um, Santa Fe is right here. Santa Fe is the oldest capital in the entire United States because it was a capital city back when it was part of Mexico before the United States was even a country. I can't wait until Abuelito comes, said Josefina. She thought that the arrival of the caravan was the most exciting thing that happened on the rancho. The wagons were full of treasures to be traded in Santa Fe. But the most important treasure the caravan brought was Abuelito himself, safe and sound and full of wonderful stories. Sometimes the caravan went through sandstorms that were so bad they blocked out the sun. Sometimes robbers or wild animals attacked the caravan. Sometimes the caravan had to cross flooded rivers or waterless deserts. Abuelito loved to tell about his adventures and the sisters loved to listen. I am going to go on the caravan with Abuelito someday, said Francisca, dreamily swirling a shirt in the stream. I'll see everything there is to see and then I'll settle down and live in Mexico City with Mama's sister, our Tia Dolores. I am sure she lives in a grand house and knows all the most elegant people. Clara rolled her eyes and scrubbed hard with her soap. That's ridiculous, she said. We hardly know Tia Dolores. We haven't seen her for the whole 10 years she's been living in Mexico City. Francisca smiled a superior smile. I am older than you are, Clara, she said. I was nearly six when Tia Dolores left. I remember her. Well, said Clara tartly, if she remembers you, I am sure she won't want you to live with her. Francisca made a face and was about to say something sharp when Josefina piped up. Anna, said Josefina, trying to keep the peace. What do you hope Abuelita will bring on the caravan? Shoes for my two little boys, Anna answered. I hope he brings that plow Papa needs, said Clara. She was always practical. Oh, how dull, said Francisca. I'm hoping for some new lace. You think too much of how you look, said Clara. Francisca smirked. Perhaps you ought, she began. But Josefina interrupted again. Well, I know one thing we all hope Abuelita will bring, she said cheerfully. Chocolate. Lots, said Francisca and Clara. They spoke at exactly the same moment, which made them laugh at each other. 
You haven't said what you're wishing for, Anna said to Josefina. She was squeezing water out of a petticoat. Perhaps you're hoping for a surprise. Perhaps, said Josefina, smiling. The truth was, she didn't know how to name what she wished for. What she wanted most was for her sisters to be at peace with one another. She wanted the household to be running smoothly and Papa to be happy and laughing again. She longed for life to be the way it was when Mama was alive. Right after Mama died, Josefina had felt that the world should end. How could life go on for the rest of them without Mama? It had seemed wrong, even cruel somehow, that nothing stopped. The sun rose and set. Seasons passed from one to another. There were still chores to be done every day. There were clothes to be washed, weeds to pull, animals to be fed, socks to be mended. But as the year passed, Josefina began to see that the steady rhythm of life on the rancho was her best comfort. Mama seemed close by when Josefina and her sisters were together doing the laundry or mending or cooking or cleaning. The sisters tried hard to do the chores the way that Mama had taught them. Every day they tried to remember their prayers and their manners and how to do things right. But it was not easy without Mama's loving guidance. Josefina looked at the primroses in her pouch and thought of Mama. Mama had such faith in them all. She brought out the best in them. Now that she was gone, they struggled. Francisca and Clara squabbled. Anna worried. Josefina felt lost and unsure. And Papa was very quiet. Josefina sighed. She didn't see how the caravan could bring anything to help them. Here comes a surprise, said Clara, but not one you will like, Josefina. Josefina looked up. Oh no, she said. It was a small herd of goats. They were coming down the hill to drink from the stream. Josefina disliked all goats and one in particular. The biggest, oldest, meanest goat was named Florecita. Florecita was a sneaky, nasty bully. She bit, she rammed, and she'd eat anything. Josefina was afraid of her. She frowned when she spotted Florecita at the edge of the herd. Now, Josefina, said Anna when she saw her frowning, you mustn't dislike these goats. This is our herd. Most of the rancho's sheep and goats were still in the summer pastures up in the mountains. But this herd was kept close to the rancho to provide milk to drink and to make into cheese. It was a small herd that had belonged to Mama. She left the herd to Josefina and her sisters when she died. Josefina wished she hadn't. Mama had always protected Josefina from things she feared and disliked. And Mama had protected Josefina from the goats. The goats are everything you are not, Josefina, Mama used to say. They are bold and loud and disagreeable and mean. It's no wonder you dislike them. Josefina was sure that Mama never intended her to have anything to do with the goats, so she avoided them as much as possible. But right now, Josefina saw Florecita headed straight for her. She wants the flowers in your pouch, warned Francisca. Josefina put one hand over the flowers. She did not want Florecita to have them. They might be the last primroses of the year. Shoo, she said to Florecita feebly, waving her free hand. Go away. There we have a goat. <laughs> shoo, shoo, 
shoo, cried her sisters with more force. Floricita didn't even slow down. She kept walking steadily toward Josefina. Her yellow eyes were fixed on the primroses in Josefina's pouch. We have a stick at her, suggested Francisca. Splash her, suggested Anna. Throw a pebble at her, suggested Clara. But Josefina backed away. She had been poked by Floricita's sharp horns before, and she had no wish to be poked again. She scrambled up and stood on the log over the stream. Still, Floricita did not stop coming. Josefina took one backward step, then another, then splash. She missed her footing and fell off the log into the stream. It was very shallow, so she landed hard on the bottom. Oh no, she wailed. She saw that all but one of the sprig of primroses had fallen out of her pouch. The flowers were floating on the water. Floricita snatched them up in her mean-looking teeth. She chewed them, looking satisfied. Then the goat turned and sauntered off to rejoin the herd. Are you all right? Anna asked kindly. She helped Josefina to her feet. You really must not let Floricita bully you like that. Josefina wrung out her skirt and smiled. I tried to stand up to Floricita, she joked, but I ended up sitting down, didn't I? She laughed along with her sisters, but she was annoyed with Floricita. She was even more annoyed with herself for letting Floricita scare her. As she looked at the one sprig of primroses left in her pouch, she thought of another thing she wanted that the caravan could not possibly bring her, the courage to stand up to Floricita. And that's the end of chapter one. So in the story, you heard them talking about their mom's sister, uh, Tia Dolores. The word Tia in Spanish means aunt. So they're calling her Aunt Dolores. So that was our introduction to Josefina. She likes to laugh and make people in her family laugh. She likes to be positive. And she's had a lot of adjustments to make in her life. But that's it for today. I hope that you enjoyed hearing about Josefina Montoya and that you'll be back to hear chapter two.